All right, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the projects that uh, emerge at the end of this uh, weekend. Uh, but uh, I just want to uh, talk today a little bit about sort of uh, what we do at the graphics department at the Times um, and both give you a sense of what we do, uh, what I think data visualizations and graphics are good at, um, and also uh, as you sort of approach your projects, a few things that you should think about that we always think about as we're actually launching into projects in terms of like what really makes a good information graphic or data visualization or representation of data uh, to tell a story. So who's the graphics department at the Times? Um, we're a group of about 30 people. Uh, this is a, a staff picture from earlier this year, a couple people missing, but it's most of us. Uh, there I am uh, in the back. Uh, but it's a really, a, really a great department because uh, we have a really wide range of skill sets and interests and people in the department. Um, everyone ranging from cartographers to uh, people who came up this, through the traditional journalism route to statisticians to web developers to 3D artists. Um, so it's a pretty eclectic group of people and you're sort of guaranteed on any project you can find someone in the department who has an interest in that or can help with some component of the project. So uh, what does the graphics department do? We research and create the maps, charts, and diagrams for the New York Times uh, in print and uh, also on nytimes.com. Uh, the, in, the interactive portion uh, of what we do is a pretty recent thing within the last uh, five or six or seven or eight, nine years or so. Um, but the graphics department actually at the Times has a pretty long history. Um, it actually started off as a map department decades ago. Um, I went looking a few years ago for the first election map uh, published the day after the election in the Times. Uh, I found it in 1896 um, on the, about half of the front page. Um, I have no idea how they got the results so quickly. Um, although if you actually go back and look how the states really did vote, uh, there's a few states in the West where they weren't quite correct. Uh, but uh, over the years, uh, the maps department uh, grew a little more sophisticated. Uh, here's, I think this is about 1916, uh, the election map, which my favorite thing on it is now. Uh, it's a little uh, more refined. Uh, and they've also added a category for the uh, states that are doubtful, uh, the ones that haven't uh, too close to call still. But we'll, what we do, we make maps. Uh, this is a map showing the path of a hurricane go, uh, where it's projected to go through Florida. We do charts um, and tables. Um, this is a pretty simple table that we did uh, in print uh, comparing uh, traditional uh, Russian and Iranian caviar to caviar that they're trying to uh, grow in Kentucky. Um, you'll notice uh, uh, in the picture on the paper, my favorite thing is that actually in the paper, the size of the caviar eggs were actual size. We do charts, we do a lot of charts. People, you hear graphics department, you think of like illustration and artwork. Probably two thirds of what we do, at least, if not well more, is actually charts and uh, maps rather than uh, diagrams. Uh, this is a chart showing uh, margin of victory and the number of electoral votes uh, uh, back in the 2004 election. And we do what you would often think of as diagrams, and it's something like a crane collapse. We have a terrific staff of uh, artists who actually are capable of turning around some great stuff uh, on deadline to show, like, what actually happened in this crane collapse, in this case overlaying an illustration with uh, a photo of the actual uh, scene. So what, that's like the sort of physical product that we create, either in print or online. But really, like, what are those, what are those graphics that we do uh, let the reader uh, understand? Like, how does, this, how does this help their understanding of their stories? I think there's a f maybe about four main areas that uh, graphics and data visualization uh, break down in. First, they provide context to stories and really sort of like let pe people see where this story fits in the big picture. I'm gonna uh, switch over to one of my uh, favorite graphics. We did this about uh, four, three or four years ago, uh, looking at the unemployment rate. And this is uh, as the recession was uh, sort of picking up into full gear. Um, and uh, if everyone probably knows once a month, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases report uh, the latest uh, unemployment rate. Uh, for the nation, there's a lot of focus on it. It's like, how many jobs did we add? Did we add 100,000 or 110,000? Did we add, uh, did the unemployment rate go from 8.1% to 8.2%? Is it up to not 10% yet? Um, but one of the things that's interesting and we sort of wanted to try and show to readers is that really there's a wide range of unemployment rates for the country depending upon who you are. So 
this, at this point, the unemployment rate was 8.6% for everyone, and that's sort of about the headline number that you'd often see reported and people making a big deal of in stories. But if you're a white woman who is aged 25 to 44 and had a, was a college graduate, the unemployment rate's only 3.6%. However, you're, if you are a black man aged 15 to 24 who never graduated from high school, nearly one out of two is unemployed. And so this is like a pretty simple graphic. Um, it's just like charts for all of, like there's a line for each of the combination of factors in there. But I think it's just really effective at sort of hitting home at that point that like how sort of there's this wide spectrum of uh, employment and unemployment situations in the country, depending upon your background. Uh, information graphics are also really great at revealing patterns. Um, and showing patterns and letting people see those patterns in a way that's maybe harder to understand in prose. Uh, this is a graph I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it later in the presentation, but this is just uh, a graphic we did after the political conventions this year. It's sort of a souped up word cloud um, that uh, looks at the language that was used by the speakers at the Republican and Democratic convention. Um, and basically, the bigger it is, the more often they use those words. And you'll see each of them is split between uh, red and blue. So the ones that are mostly red are words that were used mostly by Republicans. Uh, the ones that were mostly blue uh, were used uh, mostly by Democrats. And it's like just a visual way of like letting people sort of understand the patterns of uh, language that were used at the political conventions. Uh, information graphics are also great at describing processes and really like letting people see something that might otherwise uh, be hard to just like write and understand. Uh, this is a graphic uh, we did, and I'll, uh, I won't show it here, uh, but you can look at it later if you want. But it just basically shows like what are the mechanics of uh, a uh, hurdler, uh, like an Olympic class hurdler, like as uh, she actually goes and jumps over the hurdles, like what does she do? Like where does she take off? What is she, like the movement of her legs? Uh, how does she jump? How does she time it? And just really let people like see something. Like you could write about that in print, but just like being able to tell, like have people actually see what's going on at the same time um, is a really effective use. Uh, information graphics, uh, also great at explaining the geography behind news stories. Um, and there's a couple, couple ways that this actually works here. There's times uh, when you, to actually really understand a news story, you need to understand sort of like how the physical geography of the land uh, actually relates to the news. Um, this is a map, uh, interactive map we did uh, after Hurricane Sandy that showed the extent of the flooding. Uh, and you actually see places where in uh, 
uh, Allison County, Kentucky, almost one out of every two people in the county were just on food stamps. And so it's like being able to go in and like drill in and see like uh, the geographic patterns in terms of like here the like rural Kentucky is probably the most dependent upon food stamps of any place in the nation. Uh, but also just going and find like in my county where I live, like what percent what percentage of people actually receive food stamps in Middlesex County, New Jersey? Three percent. Just being able to sort of see yourself and how you compare the nation. The final thing I think that uh, graphics really is sort of what you do is sort of enable the impossible. That we can, like, through graphics and, like, really take and show people things that they'd otherwise never be able to see. Um, I'm just going to show one quick example of one of the graphics we did uh, last year that did this, where uh, with the Olympics coming, uh, we wanted to say, like, how good would your samples performance compare, not just to, like, the other sprinters this year, because then you could watch on TV. But what if we like created an impossible scene? What if we had him racing against every sprinter who had ever medaled in the Olympics in the hundred meter dash? Just how fast was Usain Bolt's gold medal sprint? Let's put him on a slightly bigger stage and see him race against every Olympic medalist since 1896. This imaginary race, assembled using runners' average speeds, reveals just how much faster sprinters have become. A few lanes over, we see another Usain Bolt, who dominated the field in Beijing in 2008. Almost 10 feet back, Carl Lewis, gold medalist in Seoul in 1988. He won in 1984 too, one of just a handful of sprinters on this track class. As we go further back in time, we pass more of the fastest sprinters in history. Jim Hines, the first man to break 10 seconds in the Olympics. Jesse Owens won four golds in Berlin in 1936. Archie Hahn, Milwaukee Meteor, who won three events in 1904. And finally, near the end of this track, we have Tom Burke, who won in Athens in 1896. His time, 12 seconds, puts him more than 60 feet behind today's winner. So what can we take away from this picture? For one, a lot of these sprinters are from the US. Although Americans have had a rivalry with British sprinters, and, more recently, Caribbean athletes, nearly half of these runners are Americans. But we can also see the glorious fleeting. Repeat performances are rare. There's been a new winner on the podium in all but three Olympics. But to get a little bit more perspective, let's see how some of America's best young sprinters would fit into this group. Here are the fastest kids at the 100 meter dash at different ages, as recorded by the Amateur Athletic Association. Obviously, they're way behind today's athletes. But they're not as far behind as you might expect. America's fastest eight-year-old did the 100-meter dash in 13 and a half seconds, which would have put him less than a second off third place in 1896. Not bad for grade school. And the record for 15 to 16-year-olds was a 10.27. Good enough for a bronze as recently as 1980. Still, it's not like those Olympians were slow. Despite more than a century of improvements in nutrition, fitness, footwear, and track surfaces, the difference between today's athletes and the fastest humans of the 19th century? Just about three seconds. Um, so I think that's just like a really sort of fun way to just like experience that and let, really let people see like, like how does performance really fit? Like how does it compare? So three, three keys, um, I think, that I like to think are present in any like, sort of really good graphic. To have smart content, where the content really is like the like, really appropriate, best content that you can have to explain the story you're trying to tell. It's not necessarily the most easily available content. You want to have an engaging form um, that really sort of either like, hooks people by like, what it looks like, or the video, or like, some aspect of it really catches people's eye and like, explains something to them. Um, you can do many, many uh, data-driven uh, pieces as either scatter plots or even just like tables full of numbers. But without that sort of form that like interests people and like gets them um, to sort of say, hey, like this is like I understand this now. This is interesting to me. Like this is why it's interesting. Like it's really going to be hard to get people. But you also want to have a clear presentation and make sure that 
like the way you're visualizing and representing that data is both clear and is a sort of honest portrayal of what you're trying to show. All right, so how can you do it? Uh, number one on the list, reported research. If there's one thing I think that leads to a good graph more than anything else, um, it is good reporting to find like what's the best content to explain the story I'm going to tell. Um, and then, like the questions here are like both like what information do you have, um, but also what information should you have. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this was a quick uh, project that we did uh, back uh, in started in January of last year uh, when. Uh, ever since the Citizens United uh, campaign finance decision by the Supreme Court, it basically opened up the playing field for groups to make, uh, for people to make very large uh, donations to uh, these new super PAC organizations uh, who could uh, buy advertising and try and influence uh, the presidential election. And January was the first time, really, that most of the super PACs that uh, were going to be influential in the, uh, the, uh, the presidential campaign had to reveal their list of donors. Uh, so this is about a day and a half long uh, project uh, that we did uh, going into this. And like, uh, as the final deadline was coming up, we said, you know, like, we really need to do something that really like lets people see like who's really funding the super PACs. And we weren't really even sure what we were gonna get in terms of like, we didn't know were we were gonna get 10 donors each to the super PACs that had given, like a super PAC that had given like a million dollars each, or you get like 5,000 donors who had given anywhere from $5 up to however much. But we, but we knew that and we knew that there were some very large donations out there. So we thought, like, how can we, like, how can we, uh, like, get the best information to put up online to go along with this? Um, and the good thing about the donations is most of the data is uh, from comes from the Federal Election Commission. At this point, we're pretty adept at downloading their electronic filings and uh, picking them apart to see who's in that. But one of the things we want to do is like that's sort of the easily obtainable data. Um, one of the things we're going to do is we're doing this is like say, hey, how can we go beyond that and like really help people understand? Because sometimes what you get with the FEC for the filings um, is you get things like you'll get a name of a person who gave a million dollars, and it will list their occupation as like self-employed investor, when really that person may have been a former bank capital uh, partner of Ronnie. So. Uh, as a result, as we're getting the filings that are coming in throughout the night, um, they come in, they uh, start trickling in as early, early in the afternoon, came in all the way until midnight. Uh, we had uh, about three or four people, both in the graphics department and also our campaign finance support, who were looking at the filings. And as stuff was coming in, like, how can we take and sort of flesh out those descriptions of people so that it didn't just say, like, self-employed investor or, like, homemaker, but it's really the wife of, like, Mitt Romney's uh, one of his former partners or something like that. And so, um, as the results came in, we just basically had a spreadsheet that we kept going with like, all right, here's the, how the name appears in the FEC and the address and the occupation, and here's like an actual description of that person that we want to actually put up online to help people understand it more. So just like, on every project, we sort of want to think like, all right, there's like some publicly available data uh, from this one agency that would be great to put up online. But can we take it, can we enhance that with either our own report, additional reporting or data from another source? What is going to seem interesting to We also try to the same line, think of things that are not going to be necessarily like the most obvious targets to go after. Your mind, because you're doing that. Uh, and sort of report out there. Um, one of the things we wanted to do uh, when rumors of Steve Jobs' health started circulating uh, was say, like, you know, we should get something ready for uh, if he does in fact die or leave Apple or serious health problems. Um, and one of our graph senators, Sean Carter, the same distributor, started digging around to sort of figure out, like, what's the interesting take on this? The obvious take is, like, you can do Apple stock price over time, you can do, like, a timeline of Apple products, which they, like, is there a more interesting way to sort of uh, get inside uh, Steve Jobs and sort of look at his influence at Apple? And one of the interesting things that Sean found in digging around is that there were, uh, more than 300 patents that Apple had where Steve Jobs' name was listed on them. So like, hey, that's kind of interesting. Like, right, like, is that something? Like, maybe that's a way to look at it. It's like, uh, through the products his name was listed on. But then we thought, hey, you know, maybe it's a thing where just like everyone at Apple, they file a patent and say, hey, I'll put Steve Jobs on. Uh, one of our reporters from the San Francisco Bureau did a little check in the sources inside Apple and found out they if Steve Jobs' name was actually listed on a patent, it actually meant that he had actually had some sort of role in the sort of creation of that patent or product. 
Um, so I thought, hey, this is a great way just to let people sort of see the wide range of things where he was supposed to capture everything from some of the first uh, Apple, this is Apple III, through iPods, Macs, and then some odd things like the last staircases at uh, Apple stores, where he is also listed out that he had Second thing that we're always thinking about as we're sort of approaching a project and it might be to people is uh, sketch the data you have. Like, uh, this is one of my colleagues um, says, like, make 500 charts and pick the best one. Um, and it's really great, and it's like so easy to say, it's fresh, man, so easy, but it's easier to say it's in every report. And actually, like, experiment with the data, look at it in different forms, plot different charts, plot, plot it different ways using. Uh, either programming languages or computer software like R, um, or even Microsoft Excel. Um, we got data from Netflix on uh, the most rented movies in every zip code in America. Um, and so uh, this, this is what the data looked like. Uh, you had a zip code, you had a name of a movie, you had a genre, you had, we didn't have actual numbers, we just had to wear a range in that zip code, and we had a uh, name of what that zip code was. Um, and so the first thing uh, Kevin Quayley did, who was sort of working on this, was actually just take that data and start making maps for different movies. And he just made giant, like he used uh, R, uh, some statistical software, to make a giant PDF that had uh, maps for each of the 500 best movies. Uh, just, and then we just flip through each page and look at each one. Here's Street's Case of Pension Button, popular everywhere. Paul Clark, Mall Cop, popular in the suburbs. Last Chance Harvey, uh, popular in the far out suburbs and uh, the Upper East and West Sides. Uh, Man on a Wire, the documentary about uh, the tightrope walker between the World Trade Centers, like popular in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, Mad Man at Disc One, even more of a Manhattan and hipster Brooklyn uh, <laughs> popularity. Um, and so just like, just making those 500 maps and looking to see which ones are interesting, just like doing that sort of sketching with the data, um, led to what we actually ran into graphic in the paper, which was to basically uh, find the most interesting maps and do a little annotation about why, where the patterns are where they've been in each of them. And so then online, we had all this great data, we had this sort of nationwide view of Netflix, and thought, hey, first thing we're gonna do is we should put a big nationwide map of what maps look up, of what these things look like online. Um, and so the first thing we tried is like plot doing like a nationwide map that showed every county in the U.S. Um, the thing we quickly discovered is that like if you did that, like it was really hard to see anything on a nationwide map because the big trends here were not regional trends like the western U.S. likes uh, map meant more than the eastern U.S. but really trends that were really evident if you actually zoomed in to, like these metro areas. So we decided, hey, you know, we should reorient the focus of this on uh, the metro areas. Uh, and so this is the first sketch of what the interactive version of this would look like. Um, you got 10 metro areas down here. You got a big map there. You got a little slider to switch between your movies, and you got Paul Blart's little head, uh, headline description uh, there. That got refined into a more refined mock-up in Adobe Illustrator, sort of like what we thought the interactive would actually look like. And then, the, what, then this is what it actually looked like. in its final form. Uh, the, move, the list of cities moved over to the right hand side. Fill the slider up top. You can switch between movies. Um, and, uh, and we also wrapped in a little bit of uh, included descriptions from uh, New York Times movie reviews of the movie and how it was rated on Medicare. Third piece of advice I would say to think about as you're approaching projects, and especially any sort of data-driven project, is to really think about like what's the story, and what's the purpose of the graphic, um, and what like what do you want to tell. Um, this is uh, Amanda Cox, one of my colleagues, um, is what we find of saying like nothing important is ever headlined. Here's some data. Hope you find something interesting. 
like often when you're approaching like you're doing a data project, the like initial impulse is like, hey, we've got all this terrific data that we've collected that nobody else has ever had. Let's just take and put it up all online because they'll be in love with it as like as much as in love with it as I am. But like often like people aren't going to take that same amount of time. They just get data that's up online and be like, oh, that's interesting, and like maybe poke it for a minute or two and then move on. But really, there's great stuff uh, in there. So you want to think like, how can I really bring that great stuff to the forefront? Uh, a couple years ago, we'd gotten data from Major League Baseball that showed uh, the trajectory and coordinates of every single pitch thrown by uh, every pitcher in Major League Baseball. And I want to do something about Mariano Rivera, who's uh, the Yankees' closer and an uh, absolutely amazing uh, pitcher. So this is what the data looked like uh, when we got it. Just a big, gigantic XML file. Um, and you can see, like, here's the Z position, here's the break angle. I've been working with one of, one of the companies uh, that sort of analyzes this data uh, for the TV networks. They're able to sort of figure out like, how you take this data and actually turn it into a 3D model of here's all very other various pitches in 3D. And so this was just one little thing that we had uh, what Sean Carter had hacked together to like let us see what the habits look like. And so our first thought was, hey, we've got all this data, we figured out how to like render it in 3D, you can filter it by curveballs and pitches thrown in 3D counts, like let's build a thing up online where people can do that. Um, and so this is the actual markup we did of like what that might look like. But the thing that we sort of realized is that like, unless you are a uh, major league pitching coach, like you, nobody can make heads or tails of like what it means to have this pitch go over here or down there and the patterns that are there. Um, so we sort of uh, reoriented uh, our focus a little bit, and thankfully uh, our sports graphics editor actually actually is a former uh, minor league uh, baseball coach. Um, and so he worked with a couple of uh, experts to sort of analyze what were the interesting things in the data. And we thought, you know, let's let you just tell a linear story about why Mariana Rivera is so good. So we'll take and render this in 3D. Here's every single pitch uh, through crossing the plate. We did a storyboard of like, how do we think like a linear sort of narrated piece that explains why it's uh, so good is that you can stay with Joe. Like you start off with him pitching, you Go in a close up of him holding the ball, you show the path, they throw it to different types of batters. And this is the piece to revolt it. Marion Rivera is one of the most dominant closers in history. But what may be most remarkable is that he has done it by confounding hitters with mostly one pitch, his signature cutter. John Flaherty of the Yes Network faced Rivera as a hitter and also caught him when he played for the Yankees. From a hitter's standpoint, he's out on the mound, and it feels like he's not even putting any effort into it, and the ball explodes on you. And from a catching standpoint, uh, he's the easiest guy ever to catch because he throws the ball right where you want it. Rivera uses a seemingly effortless delivery, which he can flawlessly repeat pitch after pitch. His cutter is thrown very much like a fastball, but the pitch has significant lateral movement. He creates and adjusts this movement with the different pressure he puts on the ball with his fingers. The pitch's lateral movement keeps it off the bat's sweet spot, moving in on the hands of a left-handed batter and toward the end of the bat of a right hand. To a hitter, Rivera's cutter first appears like a straight fastball, making it hard to distinguish the two pitches during the first fractions of a second when the hitter must decide if, when, and where to swing. Hitters often rely on reading a pitch's spin to determine what pitch is coming, but Rivera's fastball and cutter have what appear to the hitter as the same spin. Many pitchers throw their cutters more like sliders, with their fingers pulling down on the side of the ball. This can create more downward and lateral movement than a cutter, but it also creates the signature spin of a slider, a spinning red dot, that the hitter can recognize and adjust to. With identical deliveries and spins on Rivera's pitches, hitters are at a loss to identify and then attack the pitch, until it is too late and the balls end up in very different locations. Here are the nearly 1,300 pitches that Rivera threw in 2009, each frozen at the point when the batter must make his swing decisions. But with few clues to determine the pitch's ultimate location, the batter can be faced with guessing at these outcomes. Here are the cutters to left-handers. Here are the cutters to right-handers. And fastballs to right-handers. He throws almost no fastballs to lefties. As this map of his 2009 pitches shows, Rivera is remarkably adept at hitting the corners, keeping the ball away from the middle of the plate, the easiest spot for a batter to make good contact. Looking from this perspective, it's not surprising that the real hot spot is inside on the lefty, 
I think he could hit that spot with his eyes closed. Rivera's simple but effective formula has made him baseball's most dominant closer. So in that case, like, there's a huge amount of data that's behind that interactive. Um, but uh, I think it's like really hard to beat that as like a really like the most effective way for sort of a person to a normal person to actually take and learn like what to from that data. Uh, that's not to say every data-driven interactive you want to do wants to become a linear piece that shows you something interesting. Because there's many where the act of exploration actually like really what uh, is useful to the reader or lets them sort of find like what the data is like for people where I live. Uh, the, other, the other thing along those lines is sort of always think about like what is the story you're trying to tell? Um, in a sort of more simple way is when it comes to election results, um, on election night, obviously you're gonna have election results up on the website and the sort of way you traditionally think of visit, visualizing something like house uh, election results is like you have a map of every house district in the nation um, and you shape it by who won that district or not. Uh, this is great for like many things, like I wanna see who won the district in Northwest Minnesota, I can actually go there, just roll over and just really try to see what the results were, who won. But the thing that's just a little bit less effective at is like telling me like what's really interesting here um, and what's sort of the story of the night. Um, and so as we're designing uh, sort of our election results packages in the uh, past years, one of the things we talk about is like, is there a way to better organize the election results that really sort of highlights like uh, the data in a way that shows me like what's the story of the night? How is it expected to go versus what actually happened? Um, and one of the things we did is we so, you know, have a view of this where we arrange the districts not by something like on a map where they are um, or who held them in the past, but like how are they expected to do? Um, and our uh, congressional reporters during the campaign have been basically rating the districts, like which were the seats that we knew were basically the safe seats, like which were the ones that were the Democrats expected to win, win narrowly, which were the ones that were just toss-ups and too close to call. Um, and that was sort of as useful for just knowing like as the campaign was going on, like what was the scope of the race. But on election night, it can be extraordinarily effective to actually like arrange your results this way, because then you can actually take and look, and like as results come in, you can see if you see all red, mostly red, with no blue on one side of the board, or vice versa, you can tell like, hey, compared to what, what we thought was going to happen, the night is going to go. It's like in this case going more in the Republicans' favor because they were picking up a lot of the toss-up seats, plus some of the ones expected to go Democrats. And even if you scroll down, uh, you see one seat uh, in the solid, everyone thought was gonna go Democratic column in Minnesota uh, that the Republicans ended up gaining. And so just like that simple, like it's a very simple HTML table in many ways, but like that organization like really sort of highlights like the surprises in the story of the night and giving people a good way to sort of organize and see that. Uh, the fourth uh, piece of advice in terms of things to think about is to experiment with visual forms, like representing your data, but make sure you really think about like what is the picture and impression that somebody takes away from looking at that graphic. Uh, this is a map of uh, election results in 2008 um, that shows whether it's every county in the nation, whether uh, voted Republican or Democrat. Um, it's a perfectly lovely map. There's like 100% factually correct. Um, but as the election, like, as we were sort of saying, like, how do we represent election results uh, in the Times? Like, one of the things we said, like, you know, is this really the best way um, that there is to uh, show what the results of the elections were? Because uh, the Tanzanian popular vote with Obama got 68 million votes, McCain got 59 million votes. Um, so Obama hit by a little bit. But if you actually did calculate the amount of square miles of red and blue on this map, you have two million square miles of red and less than a million square miles of blue. Um, and we thought, you know, given that the vote like this, is there like a better form for showing election results that's more reflective of uh, the differences or like how the nation actually voted? And so we started looking at different forms of the map. Uh, the first thing we did uh, is uh, shape counties. Like, obviously, a county is not. Uh, either 100% of voters are uh, Republican or 100% of voters are Democratic. So we said, what if we shape the counties uh, by the margin of victory? So that you uh, have counties where it's like solidly, like really heavily Democratic, really heavily Republican, it's like the darkest colors, and counties where it's very close, almost 50-50 of light colors. 
Um, and that helps a bit uh, because you can sort of see like places where the support is closer and places where there's like very strong support. We still have a problem where out in the sort of the western US, very unpopulated counties that uh, take up a pretty good amount of area still showing up as solid uh, dark red. Uh, there's a professor at the uh, University of Michigan who uh, did a cartogram of the U.S. distorting each county to be the size uh, of its uh, the number of votes cast in that county, which is like a very interesting thing to do, um, but it's possibly not something that you can publish in the top times um, and expect people to say, hey, where's my county? Like, how did it go? Uh, we looked at doing 3D. Uh, where you actually take do 3D maps uh, based on the margin of victory in each county, which is also sort of interesting, although you run into a little bit of a problem because you still have a problem where Chicago and Los Angeles have about the same margin of victory, which you can see in the height, but because Los Angeles is so much physically bigger, uh, it feels like it's a more imposing presence on the map than Chicago, despite the fact that you feel about the same. Um, back in 2004, we looked at actually uh, taking and just basically taking that map, the earlier map of the margin of victory, um, and whiting out every single uh, area in the nation that had less than three miles, three people per square mile. And that was sort of, that solved the western U.S. problem, although it still leaves you with a problem out uh, more in the eastern U.S. because even if you do that, you're never really going to sort of convey the density of people packed into cities like New York and Chicago with a view like this. And so finally, the thing that we decided was sort of the best representation was a map where we did proportional circles to the margin of victory in each county, uh, center and top of the county. And a couple of advantages. One um, is that you really could see, like, you got this sort of true relationship between how much each county counted towards the margin of victory in the overall election um, on the map. Um, so you can sort of, like, if you were able to visually sum up uh, the red and blue of the map, it would sort of balance out in the correct way. Um, but it's also what you sort of see in some detail, some patterns, both at sort of like the, both the big counties, the medium-sized counties, um, and sort of, the sort of, it did a pretty good job of representing the whole spectrum of the country. The one place it falls apart is a very densely populated East Coast, where there's a lot of overlapping going on. Um, so in the end, because each form has its like pros and cons and what's conveyed, what we actually ended up doing was a combination of several different forms, where the big map that we sort of thought gave the best overall impression was the proportional circles one. <coughs> but we also had a version of just a vote by county, so that if you actually wanted to see, hey, who won all the counties in New Jersey? Did it go entirely blue or not? You could actually take a look in there. Uh, also something I was trying to think about uh, is like really, as I've said a couple of things before, like, You've got data, you've got a story. Like if you can combine the two, the data and the story are better than the data alone. And so all the expertise you've you acquired in uh, analyzing the data and figuring out how to work with it and put it up online, like you've got that expertise, share it with your readers. Uh, this was a graphic that uh, we did just a couple months ago. I worked, worked together with Rob Gibelov, one of our database editors, um, looking at the tax burden in America and how it had changed over time. Um, and months ago, like early in the year, Rob had started trying to figure out, like, is there a way to model the tax system um, in the U.S.? Because, and, and it's a tyranny. Because there's a lot of good data you can get on federal income taxes, how they've changed over time, and how it differs for different income groups. Um, and there's a lot of good data you can get on, like, types of taxes over time. How has uh, property taxes changed over time, or how has uh, But like, that data wasn't necessarily available by broken down by the different types of uh, income groups. And one of the things I want to see is like really, with all the talk about the middle class tax cuts um, and uh, uh, what the tax rate should be for wealthy people, like really how did they change over the last three decades? Um, and can we actually take and show that to readers, not just federal income tax, because that's sort of an increasingly small percentage of the tax burden uh, these days. Uh, so Rob built this sort of statistical model that have, you can fact, feed in all sorts of factors, like uh, the income of a person, what state they lived in, the, uh, whether they own a home or not, whether they're married or not, how many kids they have, uh, and actually sort of model what the taxes look like for everyone in the nation 
over the last 30 years. Um, and once again, sort of our first thought was like, hey, you know, we got this amazing model, maybe there's some sort of calculator you can build to uh, let people plug in their numbers, like plug in numbers and see what the result was. If I make $75,000, I live in New Jersey, and I own a home, this is what I would have paid in 1980 versus now. But, like, the thing was just that, like, if you did that, basically you're relying on readers to try and like plug in hundreds of numbers and figure out like what are the most interesting trends. So I thought, you know, like in this case, the calculator doesn't make sense. Like, how can we actually sort of like do a series of interactive charts um, that sort of walks people through what's interesting in the data that we've learned from the reporting on the trends we've seen? And so this is actually um, a pretty simple, actually, interactive in many ways. Once again, with all the data that underlies it, you have the ten income groups along the top. And you have uh, what their sort of overall, like how much of their income they paid in taxes going back starting in 1980. Um, and you sort of see, we walk people through, like, all right, here's the overall trends. Um, a lot of the US has gone down uh, a little bit, but fairly flat. Um, and then, but for the highest income, like they've seen, seen some of the uh, biggest percentage drops. Um, and then explain to people, like, why is that? Like, here's how federal tax rates for all groups have really dropped. Um, but while they have, while the federal income tax rates are most, thing we most commonly think of with taxes have dropped, like income taxes have, or payroll taxes have risen for everyone, state and local uh, taxes have risen for everyone, but especially for the lowest income groups, and corporate taxes, uh, which are ultimately paid by the decline, sort of like really walk people through, here's, here are the interesting trends in the data, and let them see what they are. And also have things like like the expertise, even on big very data driven things, just be as simple as like a few annotation points to get somebody started. Uh, this is just the graphic we built on uh, the words that were used at the political conventions, um, where you can do things like uh, you could add your own words, see how often they use the word. Uh, anyone have any ideas on anything you'd like to see what words that were used? Uh, there's a uh, percent by itself. Um, so you can, you can explore this, but just to like, get people started, we added like a, uh, just like a simple annotation of like, here's four interesting trends, um, or four interesting words. The Democrats talk almost exclusively about the auto industry uh, compared to the Republicans, while um, Republicans were much, much more likely to uh, mention unemployment. Uh, and the annotation can be in other forms other than just like sort of text and explanation. Um, this is a story that uh, Charles Duhigg, one of her reporters, did about uh, a nursing uh, home in uh, Florida uh, that had this very sort of com complex ownership structure around it uh, to take and uh, sort of shield it from lawsuits and so forth. And as you can see, it's just like a graphic we did to try to show the ownership structure uh, right on the front page. Like it's a perfectly fine graphic. But the thing actually that where the graphic really I think is good is we actually just took in like recorded audio of Charles walking people through what that structure was. When a group of investors purchased a Tampa nursing home named the Havana Healthcare Center in 2002, it became surrounded by a web of companies that shielded the home's profits from lawsuits. Following the purchase of Havana, Formation Properties leased the nursing homes to Florida Healthcare Properties which in turn subleased it to Tampa Healthcare. Florida Healthcare Properties and a sister company, Seacrest Healthcare, were owned by four companies with no assets, offices, or employees. The executives that owned Florida Healthcare and its affiliated companies at the time also worked for a different nursing home company named Centennial Healthcare, which had been purchased two years before by the large private, private equity group, Warburg Pincus. Those so in this case, it's like, it's a fine diagram when you see it by itself, but like, when you really sort of add that layer of annotation to it, I think it really becomes like much, much more interesting. 
And the final thing um, I would say to think about as you're doing a project is really like consider the user and like think about what is this visualization to visualization telling them? How are they going to use the graphic? How are they going to interact with it? Is the interaction design and the user interface like very clear and show them uh, something in a way? Is the point of the graphic clear? And as I said, like graphics can have many different purposes. Um, a couple of the earlier maps were really designed to let you drill in and say, find like in your zip code, how many, uh, what was the movie rental patterns like, or in a county, how many people were in food stamps. But then there are graphics that are sort of more impressionistic, where you sort of want to like convey like the big picture. Um, this is something I read in print, uh, looking at uh, where people who were displaced by Hurricane Katrina had gone. Uh, we got data from uh, FEMA. Uh, that showed uh, where people were located when they filed disaster uh, relief uh, applications because they had to list the zip code of their current address. Um, and then they just sort of let us see, like, all right, everyone who had been displaced from New Orleans and had applied for Hurricane Katrina disaster relief, um, like, where would they say they were? And you can sort of see, like, obviously the Gulf Coast, still a lot of people there, but like pockets bringing up 80,000 uh, people in Houston versus 30,000 in Atlanta. And the point of this graphic is not to let, let you say, hey, there's like six people in this county in rural Iowa, but to give like this sort of nationwide impression. Whereas meanwhile, other graphics are very much more about letting you drill in and say, hey, this is a topic that might be important to me. I want to know something about very specific to me. I want to find myself in the graphic. Um, a couple of years ago in a series uh, called Toxic Waters that uh, Charles Duhay uh, was a reporter on also, uh, we worked with the environmental working group uh, who had gathered uh, water quality tests for every water system in, uh, in America based on milk and records requests and so forth. Um, we thought, like, all right, this is a place where the story's only going to touch on a couple places, but like, there's all this data out there. It's in really hard to get, hard to understand formats from uh, state and local governments. Um, how can we take and sort of organize this data so people can look up their water system and sort of see like both context and patterns. And we thought very hard about like, as we were organizing this, like how we give them a little context. Uh, the data that comes in is just basically, it's a test date, it's the name of a chemical or substance, and like the value of the test. So first, how can we organize it to sort of say, hey, these are the things we should possibly, uh, the chemicals that uh, possibly worry about. So very clearly organized into uh, tests above legal limits. Tests that were below legal limits, but above uh, sort of commonly accepted health guidelines. Um, and then in fact, the candidates that were tested for and found, but there was uh, both present within guidelines and legal limits. So sort of took the context of like, all right, should I care about a, like a 25 parts per billion? But then also say like, hey, what are other patterns in this stuff? Like some, some things they test for, um, it could be something where it's, they test every month they've only found it a couple times versus ones where they test for it frequently um, and it shows up almost every time. So we thought, like, we put a little visual timeline of uh, every month uh, over the last five years that they then test for that chemical that month, like showing uh, orange or red and sort of uh, had a reading that, that was that high that month. So it's sort of, once again, thinking about like both context and like what patterns we like help people uh, understand here. Um, one of the things I also think, in terms of as we think about like how a user is going to like understand a subject, is really the web has sort of opened up the opportunities for engagement, um, and really like that act of engaging people in a graphic can help them understand the story uh, in a way that they otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, we did this a couple of years ago. It was a budget uh, puzzle, uh, basically where you fix the federal budget, you pick the things that you would uh, want to cut. And we've done, like, we've done graphics in the past that basically like, that ran in the paper that were like, all right, here's how much potential cuts the budget would be. Um, like this program you cut 40 and a half, it saves uh, 17 billion, if you eliminate your mark, that's 14 billion. But like, when you just have that on a piece of paper or like you see it on a computer screen in a sort of non interactive way, like you have really big numbers, like billions, you got trillions of dollars. And I think it's just like, be hard for people to register, like sort of what that really means. Um, so here, by actually turning this into a little bit of a game, uh, you had to save uh, 1.3 trillion over the next year. And you go through and check, say, all right, let's get rid of half our four days. Let's get rid of earmarks. And you thought, hey, like if I just wrote a list, I thought, hey, I can save 31 billion dollars. That's doing great. 
But when you actually see that you're just like a fraction of a way uh, to where you need to be, like it just reinforces, I think, in some way, like how little some of the things that you think of as big numbers actually are. And by actually going through and engaging in these, you figure out, all right, I'll cut the pay of federal workers, we'll cut the size of the federal government, we'll cut aids to the states, we'll reduce a bunch of military spending, still just poking along. Get rid of reduced troop levels, medical malpractice reform. All right, we're all gonna get Medicare five years later. We're all going to get Social Security five years later. We're going to raise taxes. We're going to raise taxes a lot for everyone. Payroll tax.
I thought it was just a delightful way to really sort of hit home with readers. Like just how close are the Olympic performers? And that's it. So hopefully that's some things to think about as you launch out and find your bikes this weekend.